bunch of customers and go through a lot of, you know, how are you using APIs today? What's your strategy um, when you approach APIs and integrations? So one of the first questions that I want to ask everyone here, and we can use the Bitmojis that are next to the maturity level is, where do you guys fall within your companies of maturity of your API? You have low, medium, and high. And as you kind of put these emojis into the chat, I'll explain a little bit about each one. A low maturity is more of a you know, siloed approach. Maybe you have a gateway, maybe you're you know, just dipping your feet into APIs and you know, starting to integrate some of your systems. A medium one is still could be a little bit siloed. You work more in kind of a project-based approach, different teams manage your APIs, or maybe you do have a center of excellence, a platform where you're managing all of your APIs. And if you're at a high maturity level, you've monetized maybe your API, your whole entire company has a very API first strategy. Um, you may have some headless commerce, some things like that in there, and you have obviously a center where you're managing all your access to your API in one centralized location. For us at Altium, as Christy probably put in there already, I think we kind of fall in that medium range. We're very much um, doing it on an individual project based, where one of the projects you'll see today, the beta membership, is actually a project where we had to develop an API to sit between our website and Salesforce. Um, we do have a subsidiary that has monetized their API. They're called Octopart, and they allow people to you know, utilize that API, pay for their API and things like that. So we're starting to kind of dip our feet into trying to get to that high maturity. But I think one of the things that would be really beneficial for us are one centralized place to manage all of our APIs, and really having an API first strategy when it comes to implementing commerce, implementing new products, new experiences for our customers. So let's see what everyone says. So I see a couple lows. I see Eric, you were you were high, I think, on yours. So that's awesome to see. I see Mark, you're kind of in the middle there as well. So yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people, and that's usually where, you know, you'll find companies today. I think a lot of people are really starting to adopt APIs and see the benefit of them. So I think you get a lot of people that are in the medium range and you have some older companies that may have been around 30, 40, 50 years, they'll probably fall a little bit more in the lower range. On the next slide though, we'll talk about some of the initiatives and some of the use cases of the API. And one of the quotes that I really liked when I was kind of doing some research and, and digging into APIs more is from McKenna Consultants. And the speed of information is really what stuck out to me. So previously, there were a lot of processes that we had that were done via CSV uploads. We would take data from one system, we would upload it into the next system. And by the time we were done with those CSV uploads, there was new data already. So we already had stale data in the source system or we didn't have the most up-to-date information. So we're analyzing this data and we're looking at it, but there's new data that has already come in. So looking at that, I think, you know, the speed of information is really key um, to kind of getting that data into your source system. And I think that's where a lot of the integrations help you is that you can get this data, you can set it up every day, you can run it as soon as the data comes in, you could run it every 30 minutes, depending on your process and the need, you may set those schedules a little bit differently. Going through some of kind of the initiatives up there in the top right, 56% of people use APIs to drive better experience that were surveyed in this, and 40% do it to integrate their internal applications. Those are a couple of things that we'll talk about today. Our beta membership was really to kind of drive a better experience for our customers, as well as internally, as you'll hear. And we use APIs today to develop and integrate all of our business systems. And in the bottom left, you see some around the use cases. So the three that we're really going to focus on again are speeding up development that 58% of people said they use APIs for, connecting internal systems, and developing a B2B type of program, which again will be the beta membership that we'll step through. Let's go to the next slide here. So we have obviously a lot of cloud systems that we use. We also have some on-prem mentions databases, um, some MySQL databases, Postgres, everything. 
Um, and we need to kind of connect all this data. You've heard Salesforce really talk about their customer 360, right? That is really getting that one single view of the customer in one location. But your data may sit in all these different systems. You may have Marketo and all your marketing data is in there. You may have NetSuite as your ERP. We use Redshift to kind of collect data on our users, how they're utilizing our platform, how many clicks they're doing, you know, what activity is actually happening. Salesforce, obviously, as our CRM. On the right side, I list a lot of iPaaS tools. And iPaaS, I think, is a newer term that has come out in the past probably four or five years, and it's integration platform as a service. The processes that it facilitates are more of the ETL and ELT. And to explain both of those are extract, transform, load, and extract, load, transform. Depending on the process that you may have, one of the others may fit better, right? So you may want to extract, transform your data and load it. Let's talk about Salesforce to NetSuite. They're two different formats of data. We may need to transform something to say, okay, this payment term of 30 days actually needs the ID of one in NetSuite. So we transform that to happen. The EL, uh, ETL process where you're, or ELT process where you're extracting, loading, transforming is more going to be used in your kind of snowflake model, right? You're taking a lot of data from one system and you're putting it into a data warehouse and then you're doing your transformations inside the data warehouse instead. So depending on what you want to use or your process that you're approaching, one of those may be more beneficial than the other. But all of these tools that we list here on the right were tools that we either previously used or we evaluated when deciding what iPaaS system we wanted to use. I have a question just yep. about all the middleware things. Um, and your experience is one basically like the other, like if an admin were going to go learn how to use Boomi, would they be able to use MuleSoft or Informatica, like essentially the same way? Um, I would think from, I think MuleSoft is actually probably the one that's the most different, um, but they have in recent, I think, releases that they've had have been much more ease of use, I think was one of the things that they focused on. So we actually did this evaluation I think it was probably three years ago now. And one of the reasons we didn't go with MuleSoft is because it was very developer heavy. And there were things like you and I who are admins may not be able to kind of take on and capture. I think they've come a long way since the last time I looked at MuleSoft and they make it much easier and it's much more kind of like flow. And that was one of the reasons that we actually selected Boomi is because of that kind of flow like mentality made it really easy for people like you and I who may not have that developer experience to go in and integrate these systems. Cool. Also, I also got a question from the chat. So if you're talking to somebody who's new to integrations, are there particular middleware tools that you would recommend them learning first? Yeah, so I was actually gonna kind of touch on that a little bit. So I think each of these tools also kind of depends on the size of your company, right? So if you're a startup, I think you're probably looking more at Zapier, Worketo, Smart Log, uh, SnapLogic, because one of their pricing model and two of the ease of use. When you get into that mid-size to enterprise, I think you're looking at the Boomies, the MuleSofts, and the Intermatica. My opinion may be a little bit biased, but I think Boomi was a really good one to learn, um, and it was really easy to pick up. I think one of the hardest things when you approach integrations is actually understanding your source systems and your endpoints. And that's where I think Postman is a phenomenal tool to use. So before I build any integration, I'm always making the calls in Postman to understand what the data is, the format of the data, and what it looks like. So my recommendation is actually more on the side of if you're starting out, go use Postman and start making some calls in Postman, start making some get calls, see what that data actually looks like. Because then once you move on to some of these other systems, a Boomi, a MuleSoft, and Informatica, you're going to be able to kind of facilitate that integration far easier. Um, so really that would be my thing, but I think all these platforms have a lot of community driven kind of like Salesforce and learning capabilities. Boomi actually wants you to become a customer, all their learning is free. So you can go get certified as in Boomi for free, everything once you become a customer. So, um, I personally really like that platform. And once we click into the next slide, that's actually what we use. So we use Boomi here at Altium, and we'll talk a little bit about how we use Boomi to connect some of these systems, DocuSign, Marketo, of course, um, and how we kind of facilitate the movement of data between these. 
Before you go into that, could I ask another question that I think a lot of people will have? Like you had a lot on that previous slide, a lot of different choices. Yep. How long, I mean, everybody's experience is different, but how long did it take you to start the research and go from this very impressive and overwhelming list down yeah. to like the final candidates before choosing the winner. I mean, we know that price is always going to play a factor, but for us, yep. from our perspective, what was, what were you looking at? What were the most important things? So for me, I think it took us about three months to go through everything. And I, my approach, when I look at any systems, I always start with like a list of 10 and then get that list down to three and really evaluate those three. So we went through use cases. How can you connect to hybrid systems? So ones that sit behind our firewall, What's your pricing model? Zapier is, I believe, and I could be wrong here, but Zapier is price per zap. So every time a zap happens, there's a cost associated with it. Um, Boomi was much different. You buy a connector and you can use it a thousand times over. So if we bought Salesforce at NetSuite, we could build a thousand integrations. We're paying that set cost for the connector. Um, but it took us about three months to go through everything. We ended up demoing Boomi, MuleSoft, and Informatica. We had a Zapier account already, so we kind of knew what Zapier was and how that would work for us. And then at the end, price was a huge thing. Um, MuleSoft and Informatica were far more expensive than Boomi. And how you use them, we felt like the team that was going to manage these integrations could use Boomi much easier than MuleSoft and Informatica at the time. Like I said, I think MuleSoft's come a long way, though. Um, in some of the recent releases and, and how that platform is now used. Just curious. Eric, I was going to say maybe we save that question for the end, unless it makes sense to answer it now. No, we can save it for the end. Okay. Don't so, let me forget, Eric. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little glimpse into kind of what we have right now. And this isn't our whole architecture, but it's a little bit of what we do, right? So we have our systems of record on the left. Those clouds in the middle are our Boomi atoms. And then our right side are our operational or analytics tools. So right now we have a lot of data that sits in our CRM, that sits in Marketo, NetSuite, DocuSign, Litmus is our learning platform. We use Smartsheet for customer facing onboarding and project management. And then we have a couple databases that sit behind our firewall and that data needs to either get to Salesforce or it needs to get to our analytic solutions. And that was one of the biggest benefits of Boomi was being able to connect to systems behind your firewall as well as cloud systems. So being able to say, okay, we have a license manager um, or identity service that sits behind our firewall. How can we get that data out and how can we bring that data into Salesforce? Or if we have our, all our license activity data that sits in a, another database behind our firewall, how can we get that out and get that into Einstein Analytics so we can start to analyze some of that data? The one that we're really gonna kind of dive into here is gonna be the Marketo to Einstein connection. Um, and how we're using that to facilitate some of our marketing analysis. So just at a very high level, obviously in Marketo, there's a lot of activity that's going on. So we don't bring everything out because right now we're dumping it into analytics and Christy will know this exactly, but there is a limitation on your data set size, right? I think right now we're at 70 million rows. I forget what the exact limitation is. I think per data set it's, I don't know, a few hundred million or something. Overall, you can have like trillions of rows, but per yep. data set, yeah, there's a limit. So what we decided to do was focus this data set on, you know, the analysis that we wanted to do. And here we're really trying to figure out how successful some of our campaigns have been, how successful some of our emails have been. So we decided we're going to pull in form fills, email statistics like opens, clicks, things like that, and some website traffic. And how we do that is taking all that data out of Marketo using Boomi and then uploading it into a data set in analytics. When you approach the integration, I think as I'll kind of go back to Postman, the first thing that I always do is obviously going to see what the format of that data is. So if I make this same call in Postman to extract the activity, what do I get from form fills? What do I get from email statistics? And I can go to Christy and say, hey, what do you guys need? analysis or the dashboard that you actually want and understanding where that lives in Marketo. I use Postman to kind of go through all that, export all the data, see what it kind of looked like, manipulate it how I want, and then I'll move over to Boomi. Um, one thing to kind of note with Boomi, they have some out of the box connectors. Salesforce is one, 
Marketo, they don't have one. So you have to kind of build your own profile. Postman helps me with that so much because once I make that call out and I can see the format of the data, I can download that JSON file and upload it directly to the Boomi connector and my profile is built for me. I'm not the best at writing JSON. I could probably get there, but Postman makes that process far quicker. It takes me 10 minutes versus maybe an hour that it would have taken me to actually write that profile. So that's another way that I kind of like to use Postman while I'm building integrations. And the other thing you really want to understand is your limits, right? So Marketo has a limit of 500 megabits per day using the export of the bulk API. And Salesforce obviously has limits around how many API calls you can actually make. I think we have 2 million in our instance. We don't even come close to our limits. So we're okay there. We can make kind of the call outs that we need to. But Marketo, we've hit that limit a couple times. And diving into it, what we found was we weren't the only ones extracting data from Marketo. There were other teams also doing it. So collaborating with those teams to understand, hey, what are you pulling out? And if we're already pulling it, why don't you just use the same data set that we have? Or if you need it in a different system, that's fine. Let Boomi pull it out and we can put it into Einstein. We could put it into Tableau. We could put it into Domo, wherever you need it. But let's make one call to the system. Let's get that data and let's move forward. And then the next was what kind of data do we want to extract? So for us, instead of exporting the whole entire database, which it would have been well over 500 megabits, we export on a cadence. So this process runs three times a day. And what it does is only picks up new data. So I don't go back and grab all the old data and just replace the data. I'm only grabbing new data that has come into Marketo. And that has helped us significantly with our limits. Um, so we don't really hit that 500 megabits, I think for the past, eight months we haven't gotten any errors like that so i'll call that successful so that's a good one um but always always test 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 because you want to make sure that that integration is working the way that you want you're getting the data that you need and then once it's set you can really kind of forget about it until you get one of those errors that you're going to want to dive in but hopefully you don't get any errors you set the integration you're done you move on build your next integration and go through your uh, next project that you have So I'm going to talk a little bit now about our future state, and this is really going to kind of capture your customer 360 model, right? So as we said, in um, analytics, you have a couple hundred million rows that you can have. Now, if you combine all these tools that we have, AWS, which has activity data, some of our Postgres and SQL databases, Marketo, Google Analytics, we'd hit that limit on the first upload. So we really would like to start to get to a data warehouse where we can bring all these different tools together and as well as our on-prem databases and really feed that into a data warehouse that analytics or Tableau can sit on top of, that an AI tool can start to sit on top of and really take our whole architecture and analysis to the next level. I think we're embarking on our customer 360 journey have really kind of just started in the past year. Um, and we've done some great things, but I think this architecture here is really what's going to let us capitalize on the amount of data that we're tracking. Because right now, a lot of it is pretty siloed. And you have some standard out of the box connectors, like even for Salesforce, right? You may have a drift connection. Let, we'll talk about that one. And it, you know, brings certain data points over, but there are certain data points that you miss, right? You have some custom integrations, you have some custom processes. These integrations that are built via app exchange and things like that are for the masses. They're for something that's going to work for 100, 200, 500 companies, right? But you may have that one unique process or you want that one data point that they don't pass over. That's where a lot of these kind of iPaaS and ETL tools can really help get that data out that you need and put it into the system that you want to either make those decisions or conduct that type of analysis. So. This is what we will demo. So I'm going to talk about it just briefly here really quick. Um, we've actually built an API for this process. So we have a beta membership program for many of the different products that we have. And we have a system level API that sits here. What used to happen is someone would fill out this form. They would end up in a SQL database. Someone would have to go and see, okay, someone new came in, send out an email to five people. Do you approve? Yes, no, okay, get the NDA. Someone had to physically sign the NDA, send it to them, get that NDA back, upload it. All these things that now 
can facilitate with the use case of APIs. I don't know, Christopher, it sounded really easy before. <laughs> yeah, as long as you kept track of that email thread, right? Or someone right? wasn't out or, yeah, no, it was, it was quite simple. Sim and physically Sim signing easy. a piece of paper. You know? <laughs> exactly. Who doesn't want to get their pen and paper out and then start signing that? Quill. Quill. Uh, <laughs> tablet and chisel. So now what we do is actually we've built an API that sits on top of Salesforce, but in between our website. So once you're logged into Altium Live, we know who you are, right? We have this unique identifier, it's called the GUID, and we can kind of do some checks in Salesforce. So if you fill out this form, you're calling this API, and what this API is doing is one, making sure you exist in Salesforce and you're active, and two, it's checking if you have an active subscription. If you have both of those, it's gonna let you through and you can sign it for the beta program. What that then does is kicks off an approval process within Salesforce. So let's take it out of that email string and let's go into Salesforce and use kind of approvals so people can actually go in there and facilitate it. We can use queues where we can have more than one person on there. Anyone can go in and improve and move on. And if you have different groups, so we have, I think it's five or six different beta programs, we can design a group for each beta program. So if Christy needed to be the approver for one and Tracy the approver for the other, we can facilitate that and make it happen. And with DocuSign, one person signed a document once, and we upload that and we reuse that NDA over and over and over. And what it allows us to do is we basically replace the company name and say, okay, so-and-so, this company name now, please sign the NDA and kind of move on. And DocuSign really allows us to do that by connecting that data from Salesforce. So I'm gonna go ahead and step through this and kind of just show you what it looks like. So it's going to take three parts. It's going to be, or four parts, I guess, the website, Salesforce, and DocuSign. Let me just sign back in here so I don't lose this. I've got my form filled out already, and these are all the questions that I've answered, just telling everyone to ignore it so nothing actually happens and no one has to go in there and approve it. And I'm just going to hit submit. So as it's waiting here, this is where it's doing that API check and making sure, okay, you're active in Salesforce, you have an active subscription, and if all those check out, thank you, move on. So let me show you how that looks now. So if I go under my user in Salesforce and just refresh here, we can now see that the beta membership has come through. I'm gonna click into this and you can see, okay, it's for the Altium Designer beta, here's the company, the account is on subscription. Here's that form that they filled out and answered. And if we go under related, we can now see that approval history. So it's kind of pending approval, waiting for someone to get in there and approve it. I'm gonna go ahead and let myself go into this beta program and just approve. So we have DocuSign and it's integrated with Boomi. It runs every 30 minutes. I'm just gonna go ahead and execute this process now. And we can see how quickly this runs. Should take about, I think it's about 10 seconds, the runtime. So it's quite quick once it picks it up. Three seconds, even faster, which is good. Now, if I go to my email, don't mind the 4,000 unread emails that I have. A lot of them are spam. Dear God, Christopher. <laughs> So you can see here, it comes in, we have it branded as Altium. I put my name in there, that's the contact. We have all this information and I can go in and now sign this NDA. And I'll kind of show you where we make some replacements of data. So you can see up here, this is all kind of standard Altium. And then we put in the company name that references the tester. So that's the actual person that's signing up for the beta membership, the company that's approved. So all this kind of stays on file. I'm not gonna go through the whole NDA, but it's quite long. And here, this is Matt Schwager, who's our VP of product and release management. He signed this once. He doesn't ever have to go in and sign it again, where previously he had to sign every single time. So I'm gonna just adopt my signature, put it in. Since I didn't have a title in Salesforce, I'm gonna put it in there. Now we kind of have company information, Matt's information. We make it look like Matt signed it today, though I think he signed it a year and a half ago. So no one has to know that. Um, but we put the dates in here that he signed it, we signed it, and we can go ahead and finish. And now this is going to, nope, I don't need that. 
this is going to now send all that data back to Salesforce. We're going to get the document back. The uh, beta membership's going to go to signed. And then what kicks off is another process that takes that person and that beta membership and actually adds them to the group that they want to be a part of. Then that person gets access to our beta, can go into the forum, leave their comments, see new features and different things like that. So let me refresh this. You can see under related, here's my beta membership NDA that's all signed and executed. So if I click into that or we need to go back and check what the record look like, it's all there. You can see now down here, the date it was sent, the date it was signed, the actual DocuSign envelope ID. So for audit reasons, if you ever needed to provide that, you have it completed and now I'm part of this beta membership program. And I think that has probably saved us probably an hour and a half of human work and taken really the humans out of it outside of the approval process. And that's the only thing that they have to do. And we can give them a quick list view that shows here are all your pending approvals. Here's everyone that is approved, different things like that. So instead of going into a SQL database every day, they can come into Salesforce and see that right, right away. I have a question. Yep. So you did a bunch of stuff here and you used a couple different systems. How mm -hmm. much code did you have to write to put all this together? So the only code that was written, and I will admit I did not write it, it was our <laughs> developer Max who wrote it. Um, but the only code that was written is the API that sits in between the website and Salesforce. And all that is doing is calling that Salesforce API and saying, here's the user GUID go find them in Salesforce. One, do they exist? And two, do they have an active subscription? And if so, let them through. And if not, it presents them with an error message that says, hey, we're sorry, you cannot, um, I think it's like, we're sorry, you cannot participate in this program right now. Nice. So would you say that this is like a simple process that anyone could jump right into you? Um, or so I'd say- like Intermediate? Yeah, I'd say it's more intermediate or type of thing, but there are different ways that you could do that, right? If you had, let's say, for example, you did the check inside of Salesforce and you kind of let everyone through, you could use an easy Pardot Marketo um, regular Salesforce form. They could fill that out. And based on the checks that you do within Salesforce, you could send them an email instead and say, hey, sorry, you cannot participate at this time or, hey, you know, you're in and you go through these steps. So you could make it quite easy if you wanted to. Um, but for us, we went with the API based approach that that was in there. And um, that was about it. I don't think we had a Marketo form that could facilitate this or we didn't have the knowledge at the time that we did it to really facilitate it through Marketo. But I think there are easier ways to do it if you don't have the knowledge to write that code for sure. People are making fun of how short your NDA is, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually quite long. <laughs> Oh, Brad it says four, it's NDA light. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe we need to go back to bat and be like, do we have everything covered in this NDA? So I mean, the longer an NDA is, the less people read it. So you could just, you know. How many people read their Facebook privacy or any of those notices that come out? I think I just click accept every time. Like, I don't have the time to go through all that. <laughs> You've signed away one of your kidneys. Yeah. I'm going to start sending done. you forms to sign. <laughs> <laughs> sign. Done. Easy. <laughs> Just make sure they're electronic because I don't want to print it off and sign it with a pen. That's fine. I'll send you an electronic form that says you have to give me $100 <laughs> every week. <laughs> Oof, that's a little rough. I may, if it's that short, I may read it. So put some other mumbo, legal mumbo jumbo in there and uh, maybe then I'll sign. I'll bill you for it. <laughs> um... I have a question, Christopher. Yeah. All right. You are obviously now an integrations expert and can speak I to I wouldn't it. say an expert, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll take it. You can it. use all the acronyms <laughs> and you do it without a sense of irony or, or fear. So, um, but what is your recommendation for those of us who either just want to learn it because we see that's the way tech is going. We just want to be proactive. We want to introduce it to our, our company. Like, how did you start? I mean, I think I kind of just got thrown into the weeds. It was one of the 10 hats that we were wearing, but I'll go back to really, you know, Postman to me because it's free, because it's accessible by everyone, really just getting in there and making some call outs in the systems that you have. So do you have Salesforce? Do you have DocuSign? Like all these systems allow you to create demo accounts like DocuSign, you can create a free demo account. Salesforce, you can create a free demo account. Postman, you have a free account. So just 
try to build something, like have some fun with it. All of them have really great documentation and being able to use Postman to kind of facilitate that. That's how I used to do these beta memberships is I would go in there. I had a PDF that was there and I said, okay, and Postman, send this to me. What does that look like? What data do I get back and said, okay, now I want that DocuSign envelope ID. I want this and that. Now that I know what that looks like, go and put it in that application that we're using, which is Boomi. Um, but I think just kind of to get your feet wet, just kind of go and mess around, make some simple get calls, make some simple kind of post calls that you have there in Boomi and, you know, get the data. If you want to get a certain user in Salesforce, go in there and do the get call. I think Salesforce, you can also do it in Workbench um, and kind of exploring the API that way and understanding, okay, this is what, you know, the format of the URL needs to look like. These are the parameters that I'm passing over. For me, I'm very hands-on. So reading an article, it may not stick with me. But actually going in there and, you know, making that call and seeing what the data looks like, learning from my mistakes, that is kind of what really helps me learn. And then I can kind of figure it out that way. I'm not big on going to read an article and can learn everything from the article. I would rather just go and make the mistake myself and say, okay, that's where I made it. And now how do I kind of fix it? So um, use Postman for sure. Um, and if you have some of these integration tools, See if you can get access and just kind of mess around with it a little bit. Like I'll show you what Boomi looks like. And I think hopefully everyone's like, oh yeah, that does look like Flow. <laughs> I'll just go to this one that we have. But basically, right, you're dropping shapes onto a screen and you're oh, saying, wait, you okay. One more time. Oh, yep. Let me this one. So here's kind of what Boomi looks like, right? You have your canvas, very similar to how you have your canvas in Flow. And you have all these different shapes that do different things. So this is my starting connector in Salesforce. It's picking it up. I'm setting a couple properties here so I can use them down here and all these different branches. We're going to NetSuite. You have your mapping. So it's very, very easy once you kind of get in there and understand it. I think I made some mistakes in the beginning, 100%. And what I've actually learned more of now is how to scale these processes. One thing that I love in Boomi now that I should have wish I knew before is their flow control which allows me to do threads. And basically, if I put a thread here, it could let me run five documents at the same exact time throughout. So it really kind of speeds up your processing time where here it would be, okay, go through one document, go through two, go through three. Now it's going through five at once. Then it's up to 10, then 15, then 20. So really just kind of understanding those nuances, but get in there, play with it, make some mistakes and learn from those mistakes. You know, mistakes. Is there a mistake that that you made that you wish that you could have uh, told yourself? You know, yelled at your past self to be like, "What were you doing, bro? What like? Is there anything that's like screams out to you now?" This. So I used <laughs> to always at the end, I would just put the stop shape here. Never really would capture the error. So I never knew what happened. It always said the process completed successfully, but so and so was like, "I don't see that invoice." And Course. I was like, well, it says it was successful and it was successful because it completed all the branches. So here, what I actually do now is kind of handle these errors a little bit better and you can write them back to Salesforce. So if our invoices ever fail, I write why it failed directly back to the order. So we know what to go in and fix. It could be a duplicate customer. It could be, um, you know, some data point didn't exist, but as well as writing it back to Salesforce, what I actually do now is capture it inside of Boomi too. So that log will tell me, hey, there was an error in this process and I capture the data that I need. One, this is the contract ID that started the process and two, this is the message that I actually got for the error. So error handling is key. And I think that is one thing at the beginning, I was like, cool, it went down that path, stop, I'm good. Um, capturing that error is probably one of my biggest mistakes that I've made in the beginning. Um, and tell everyone that's learning Boomi now within our group, make sure you handle your errors at the end of the process because you will get them eventually. And it may not be your fault, it's not the process, but data could be missing, things like that. And we need our team to know that so they can go in there and make the corrections and then let the order sync back over. Got another question here. Uh, what has been your favorite API integration to build? I think you have a couple. <laughs> I would have to say most recently, probably the one that we've done for our subsidiary Octopart, which is between Redshift and Salesforce and Octopart's model, they have um, hardware parts. So obviously our company, we have a software that builds and designs PCB boards. Octopart is really the search engine that gives you how many products are available, who has it in every single click, there's a cost. So they have a click per cost model where it may be $1.25 per click. 
there's a cost associated with that. So what we actually do now is pull all the data out of Redshift and we look at the company ID and the CPC cost and find that related subscription and continue to write the number of clicks there. So now we can facilitate the billing between Salesforce and NetSuite. All of this for them used to be manual. They used to have Looker. They would download a report, go into Google Sheets, figure it all out, upload it into a CSV file, take that CSV file, upload it into NetSuite. So their billing used to be, I think it was two days, a total of 16 hours. Um, their billing now that we just did was, I think we did it in three or four hours because there's still a lot of reconciliation that they do between Redshift and Salesforce. But the Salesforce to NetSuite, the charging of the card from Stripe is now all automated. So we saved them a significant amount of time that we've gotten it down from two days to within the one day of the billing that we want to do. That's awesome. I um, I think that we should also mention, so I put in, in the chat, there's a bunch of trailhead modules to help you get started just even like thinking about APIs. Um, and then of course there's MuleSoft modules and stuff trailhead. in there too. But there's other um, kind of more admin focused things you can do to like use external services and you can mm -hmm. just like, do actions from those APIs like in your flow, um, stuff External like that. External services so. are great for like a very simple process, right? Like between Salesforce and NetSuite, there's a lot of transformation of data just because how NetSuite wants it to be in the format. But if you're basically taking, you know, a name, let's say we want to send it over to our IDS database and you want to send the name, the email, the GUID, using an external service and just making that rest call out is super, super easy and a good way to, you know, really get your feet wet inside of integrations and understanding, okay, what does the API look like? What does it need to be? What format does it need to be? Stuff like that. It's a really easy way to get started. Or for easy things like posting a Slack message, say, yep. because we're a Slack first world now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Salesforce just made that easy. Did you go through the Slack trailheads? I did. Getting I did all of them. Oh, it's so slick now. They're it's very, like very easy. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. They, um, at the Success Anywhere thing, I think it was yesterday, they made a bunch of cool announcements. So we're going to have Slack integrated into Tableau CRM now and also into Tableau. And I love it. It's pretty cool. Um, cool. Well, Tracy, do we have a winner? Oh, Sue said something. Oh, me too, Sue. How about I like enable everyone so that we can all? I did. I, I put it in the name generator. I generated the winner. Okay, who's the winner? Oh, shoot. I forgot her name. Oh, wait. I spoiled <laughs> it. I said her. It's <laughs> <laughs> a girl. The red name generator has picked Sarah Wang as the winner of the certification voucher. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations, Sarah. What certification Ooh. do you want to go get next? <laughs> Too many to choose from. Yeah, there there are a yeah, ton. I think to I choose enabled from. everyone. Yay. Sue, I was really excited um, about like the actual workflow capabilities inside of Slack. We mostly just use Slack to like gossip and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes to work, but but there's some really cool capability. I love the uh, the service first or slack first service models that salesforce is talking about about like how creating a swarm to like quickly tackle cases as a group and then it just oh, goes you've away been all about that this week i know i think she said slack first world on every single meeting that i've been on i keep saying it though because my boss really hates slack <laughs> and so i mostly just say it to annoy him <laughs> Well, now that know, everyone's so enabled, okay. <laughs> anyone else have some cool integrations or API kind of things that you guys are building or that your companies are doing that you want to share? I know you do. Or any any problems you guys are experiencing that you feel you need to vent about. It's a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I really like that presentation just because I got done with a big old booming integration to load up advisor link for our camp. SIS system into Salesforce. 
So nice. everything you pointed out on there, those were great tips. And I wish I had seen that like three weeks ago. <laughs> I'm the same. I think I saw it. At, uh, uh, I went to Boomy World actually, like uh, when oh, they nice. last have it, I think 2019. And just being there and like learning some of these nuances that other people went through, I was like, yeah, I faced that problem. Oh, that's a great way to solve it. So I love like being able to collaborate in a group like this. And I think it helps me so much in understanding, oh, I could have done that or let me go back in my process and try that now. So hopefully there's some things that you get to try out now in Boomi. What, uh, Brad, how long did it take you guys to, um, to skill up on Boomi? You know what? It was because, of course, we didn't just jump in and take training. We just did it project-based. So every project brought new things in. And I think uh, just to get the straight API calls are great. I love pulling our REST stuff. That's pretty easy. The integration with our with Oracle on the back end what is very straightforward. I think each project kind of builds on stuff. It's when you have to do the transformations, like yeah. when you're bringing in, particularly the biggest difficulty was mapping over like course information and course enrollments and these program enrollment type things, which are academic into Salesforce. And then it was a lot of transformation in the interim time. So yep. the flows from entry to exit look very clean. But it's all what happens inside that's just lots of batching. And that, so one of the actually the things I think really stuck with me that someone um, had told me was trying to make as many decisions as you can in the source system, right? So if you're starting in Salesforce, any decision that you can make in Salesforce, do it there because of course you're going to increase your runtime in Boomi or any of these applications if you're making your decisions there. One example we have is if you use CPQ, you're probably familiar with bundles. And the bundles are zero dollar line items. They're there to basically tell you this product is part of this kind of family. We don't want those to go to NetSuite. So we have a little checkbox in um, Salesforce that says, hey, this is a bundle. So in our API call, we say, give me all the products that are not bundles. So instead of going into the process and saying, okay, where are the bundles, filter these out, then go to NetSuite, we don't even pick them up from the Salesforce side. So it really helps kind of make those decisions in the source system that you're pulling from. Involved planning. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yep, that's the hard part for us too. <laughs> What's a plan? <laughs> we'll figure it out version two, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're iterative, right? We're being we're agile here. We're gonna we're gonna be uh, iterative, and we're gonna change it each time. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. I just want to call out for Sarah, our winner, that uh, Christy has dropped in her email. So be sure and email Christy and she will send you, set you up with that voucher. So it's your lucky day. It's a good day today. I'm the keeper of the codes. <laughs> so I see one question about uh, MailChimp. So you're integrating MailChimp. It's a one-way sync, basically bringing data to Salesforce, but not going back to MailChimp. I think depending on you know what systems that you have, if you have any of these iPaaS systems, a good way to probably start is Zapier. Um, that's always you know my quick suggestion. If you don't have a Boomi, you don't have a MuleSoft, but as long as you have a common identifier between the two. So if Mailchimp is sending something over to Salesforce and there's some unique ID or you know an email or something like that, you can at least kind of take that information and write it back to Mailchimp. And I think Zapier actually has. Um, I know it has a zap for Salesforce. I'm almost positive it also has a zap for uh, Mailchimp. Mailchimp. A zap for security. So that's fair. That is probably one of the reasons that at the scale of our company, we didn't go with Zapier either and went with like a Boomi as well. Um, so I don't know where your company is at on your journey, but if you have an iPaaS solution that is you know, a little bit more mature, um, definitely using that to get your data back into Mailchimp would be helpful or starting to kind of look at, you know, is it time for you guys to get something like a, a Boomi, a MuleSoft, or an Informatica? I will be biased. I love Boomi, and the cost is far cheaper than both MuleSoft and Informatica. Um, so if you have the opportunity, definitely look into it. And there's a lot of other iPaaS like solutions out there. So I was going to say there's also um, solutions now that exist within like a Tableau CRM, where if you can connect oh through Tableau CRM to MailChimp to visualize that data, you can actually write that back into Salesforce just from Tableau CRM now. Um, or there's a new product, I think, um, Salesforce Data Pipelines that uses the same thing, but they called it something else for some reason, um, that does the same thing just inside of, of that platform. So there's lots of options. Oh, we have more faces now. I want to try to take a group picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell everyone to smile. Ready? 
Okay, everybody smile. There's the tongue yeah. out again. <laughs> <laughs> did you get it? Did you get it? I did it, but I didn't get it when she was holding up her things. Let me take another one. <laughs> okay, everybody hold up your lollipops if you got them. <laughs> okay, I did it. <laughs> Good job. I took several other sneaky pictures. No was <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Of course you did. It's okay. I'll only put them on Twitter later. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> For the whole world to see. Yeah. That's got to be a GDPR uh, violation somewhere. No, it's not. You guys opted in for me recording and everything. So I can use, yeah. use your yeah. likeness <laughs> exactly. yeah. wherever I want now. Oh, we have two more faces on. I took another picture. <laughs> Candid. I like it. That's that's awesome. CCPA that, uh, now, you're right, Eric. Yep, it is. Place. So everyone here is not in California, so I feel like it doesn't apply. <laughs> Mark is in the UK, so oh, that's awesome. we're like all sorts of out of compliance. What part now. of the UK? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm from like the northeast, not too far away from Newcastle, at Pond Pine. Okay. Uh, my father's uh, parents actually live in Stratford upon Avon. I was actually I was born out there in the UK. Didn't get to live there long enough, unfortunately. A couple of years, and then uh, we moved to America. America. <laughs> oh my God, his desk is covered in UK stuff. <laughs> yep, of course. Got the Union Jack. Got the England flag. Very upset um, with the you know recent Euro finals, but we don't need to talk about that. We can move on. We don't need to talk about sports at all. <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, unless we want to keep chatting, we're done. I think we would um, like to meet, of course, in person eventually, but just tracking kind of the, the Delta variant situation and whatnot. I don't know when it will ever happen, but I would love to meet you all in person eventually. Um, I was recording this, even though I started with Chris's like third sentence or something. I... <laughs> I was like, oh, um, so the video will be posted on the event link as usual. And if you missed any of our previous events um, and presentations, those are those are all there too and on our YouTube channel. So you can stalk us wherever you want. Anything Love else, it. Tracy? No, I think we got it covered. Let's, uh, yeah. let's give them four minutes back to their day. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, Sue, we'll be at Tahoe Dreaming. We'll be too. at Tahoe Dreaming, Sue. Yeah. Tracy, Tracy is doing a session on um, condensing all your process builders into a flow. So it'd be yes. super cool. Mm -hmm. When two become one, it's going to be pun filled. <laughs> Tracy loves the puns. I love the puns so hard. All right. All right. We'll see you all uh, next month. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.